There we go. Okay, sorry. And sorry, good morning, online worshipers. Um, thank goodness we got an extra hour of sleep. My daughter got married last night, and so uh, that was an exciting time and uh, a very tiring time as well. So, uh, you know, struggling just a little bit. Josh is like, we're not going to start the opening video until you get here. It's only 22 seconds. I said, I realized that we got more sleep and I'm late. And so anyway, but uh, I promise today will be, I hope, meaningful and transformational. I don't know how many of us would say that we are rich, but we are. If we make above $37,000 a year, we are in the top 4% of the population across the world. Think about that for just a second. $36,000, $37,000 a year. And if you make $48,000 a year, you are in the top 1%. Now, I would not tell you that I am rich. I would not tell you that I am wealthy until I had a, a few moments of accountability this week. So it was wedding week, and I am a procrastinator, especially with things that intimidate me. And weddings and what the dress and all that kind of stuff as mother of the bride, those things really intimidated me. So I put it off till the very last minute. In fact, it was still at alterations on Friday for its second fitting because we ordered the wrong size and it was too big, which was a good problem, but not if you need it to fit for the event. And so I was so overwhelmed midweek, and I'm like, I really want a nice necklace and earrings, you know, and I went to like Macy's, I went to the mall, I haven't done that in a, like a year, I'm like, I just do Amazon, and they didn't have nice necklaces. And so I walked by one of my favorite jewel jewelry stores, Jewelers on Main, and they, I mean, it's not all like fine jewelry, right, they have like decently priced stuff, and, and I saw these earrings, and I thought, oh, they would be really pretty with my dress, but I'm not here to buy earrings. I'm only here for a necklace, and so I found this necklace, blah, 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 and but those earrings, they just kept calling my name, and so I said, hey, could you just tell me how much those are, and she said, oh, they're $230, now listen, I'm not proud of what I'm getting ready to tell you, and uh, I looked at her, I said, What's 230 more? I said, I'll take them. And so I put them in my little car and, and drove away. And I'm like, when in the world would I say, oh, what's 230 more? You say that after you've paid for half of your daughter's wedding. And um, it was the wedding she's dreamed of since she was 10. So uh, parents, you know, when they get married, um, the venue alone costs like $5,000, and that's just to be there. Uh, I've thought about if we as a church could go into the wedding venue business, we would never have another concern about finances again. But as I was driving away, and I knew what I was going to be preaching on today anyway, I'm like, you know what? I am rich. We are rich. By the world's standards, we are rich. I shared last week in the message, we have a campus in Uganda. In Uganda. It's in Kagumba. It's led by four young men. And every Saturday, every other Saturday, they have worship. And on the off weeks, they drive a boda boda, which is a motorcycle in Uganda. And they drive it out into the bush. And when I say bush, I mean mud huts and thatched roofs. And they go out there and they're with the people. And they share with them about West and about love and, and all means all and, and that kind of stuff. And so I shared with you that Blaze, who is one of our leaders, he does our communications for us here in America as well. Uh, we gift him with $300 a month. That makes him basically upper class in Uganda. Now, one of the things we're mindful of is uh, helping them learn to be good stewards of their money. But the cool thing is we don't even have to help them. They're so generous. Like Blaze gives his salary or his gifting away to other people because he wants them to be as blessed as he is. You know, lots of churches do a series around Thanksgiving on money and finances and that kind of stuff. And, and then they do this, you know, pledge card and they send it around. That's not who we are. And that's not what this is. In fact, today's message, like, I sort of feel guilty talking about it. But it is important to talk about. Jesus talked about it, talking about money. and Because our lives are rich when we learn how to be 
rich well. And that's what I hope we walk away with at the end of today. Like having some new ideas of how we can be rich well. As a church, you already do it. So the, the only thing I would encourage you is to like look at this message as like you get your oil changed, right? When your car goes a certain amount of miles, you take it in, you get your oil changed, and they check all the things. I just want us to do like a self-check. Where are we? Are we where we need to be? Uh, are there ways that we can grow? Like, I can grow by not paying, you know, $230 for a pair of earrings. That was the most ludicrous thing I've done in a really long time. And if I'm going to do that, then I need to be willing to give that much away to someone else to make a difference in their lives. That's like the kind of self-check that I want us to talk about this morning. So instead of the worship team and you standing up and pretending to sing because we really don't sing here, y'all just sort of sway with the music. Uh, in the next few moments, I want to share with you some videos of our worship team. But I want you to very intentionally think about how you are rich. Think about the ways that you are rich. I would invite you to even get out your cell phones and your notes app and, and type it down. Being intentional about gratitude and, and feeling rich, it really makes a difference. If you're worshiping with us for the first time today, uh, we extend a very special and warm welcome to you. We do things differently here every now and then just to shake it up so that it's not monotonous and boring. And hopefully you find today is meaningful and relevant and transformative in your lives. Thanks for being here. We are rich. If you are watching this video, you are most likely to be in the top 1% of wealth in our entire world. We are rich, rich beyond measure. Over the next three weeks, we will explore what it truly means to be rich, how to be rich, and how to live our lives in such a way that we might experience this richness every day. So if you look on our West Facebook page or our, our, our website address, you see like there's this, these serving opportunities. It's called Peace, Love, Rich. And so we have partnered with over 11 different nonprofits here in our local community throughout the month of November in the hopes that as we build community with one another, we also, just like the woman you saw in the video, we do a kind thing to make someone else's life better. Now, our goal is to have 100% participation. And, and you can make that really easy, actually, like right after worship, the kindness closet. That is one of the, the local missions here that is a part of our DNA throughout the year. We have the opportunity to package some things up for them following worship. And so I hope you'll stay five or ten minutes extra. We're going to cut out a little sh short today so you can go and spend some time doing that. But look, like the whole point of this series is if we will use the resources that we have, whatever riches that we have in our lives, and if we will use them to not be so focused on ourselves, but to do something for somebody else, that, I mean, I'm telling you, the difference that it makes within us is just huge. Like a couple of weeks ago, uh, yeah, I've lost all track of time. Like uh, on October 22nd, we had a Halloween event, a uh, Halloween extravaganza. And, and many of you supported that. And if you weren't able to be here that day, you gave money towards it. You bought candy for it. We had over 1,000 people here on site that day, over 400 children. You made a difference in somebody's life by doing a kind thing. And then after that, uh, we had a golf tournament, and we got the final results this past week for the golf tournament. It was the first one we've ever hosted as a church, and all of the proceeds are going to support our Uganda campus and to help those gentlemen get their, their football team. It's what we call soccer, but that's their evangelistic arm of the Uganda campus as they are starting a football team there in Uganda. Two of the guys play 
for Uganda, soccer or football. And so uh, that's the way that they think they can reach new people with the message of Christ. And so we're so excited about that. So the monies raised from the golf tournament are going to help them get some of the supplies that they need and help us, you know, gift them and, and support them like in buying their internet. The crazy thing about Uganda is that, you know, for $300 a month, they are considered upper class. But the cost of things in Uganda is very similar to the cost of things in the United States. And that is just what is so crazy. Like internet. You would think that if $300 is a wealthy person's salary, that their internet would be like, you know, five or six. It, it isn't. It's more like 60. And so there's, that's why poverty is such a real thing in, in some of the nations in Africa. But anyway, the golf tournament that you help to put together raised six cleared six thousand dollars I mean that was amazing so um Thank you for doing that. Thank you for sponsoring. Thank you for getting gifts for the little bags. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. So that's why I'm like, you know, I know in preacher world and church world, you're supposed to talk about giving and, and that kind of stuff. But you folks already do it. You live it. It is a part of our DNA. It's, it's frankly why we don't have a, a big fancy building. We could put millions of dollars and have capital campaigns and all that kind of stuff to get a big fancy building with stained glass and, and really cool stuff that the worship team don't have to set up and tear down every Sunday. Or we could be here. And then we could use our resources to support 11 local missions and then two global missions, both of which are in Uganda. Like you already do this. But like I said earlier, like, let's do our own little oil check. Let's just make sure we are where we need to be. Because one of the statistics that Andy Stanley, who is the pastor of North Point Community Church, shares is that in a, a study done by Barna, the more you earn, the more we earn, the less generous we are. I was taken aback by that. I'm like, is that really right? Because, like, um, I had the privilege of serving as the associate pastor at, at Williamson's Chapel, and, and that was a very wealthy congregation. The people that were a part of that church at that time, they were uh, CEOs and executive vice presidents of some of our biggest corporations around here. There was a lot of money in that church. But the research proves the more money we have, the less generous we are. And so the question comes, like, why is that? And what folks say is that we get scared that we're not going to have enough. And so we start saving it. And saving is savings are good and important. And there's percentages. And Dave Ramsey and his Financial Peace University, like they, they lay out like what you should be saving long term, short term, and, and that kind of stuff. But we get scared because that's where we put our hope. We put our hope and our dependence on financial means. And we're scared like if they go away, we aren't going to have enough. And one of the things that we believe as followers of Christ is that at some point when we face those difficult circumstances, even though things may be scarce at times, we will always have enough. You know, that was the whole point of the story, or one of the points of the story of the people in the wilderness. And when uh, they got manna from God, when the Israelites were, they had left their slavery and their captivity, and they were trying to get to the promised land. And, and they were so hungry and thirsty and angry and scared. And they're like, Moses, why in the world did you lead us here? You know, we're going to be out here and we're going to die. Thanks. We'd rather go back into slavery. And so Moses went and had his space and time with God. And he's like, look, I need a little help. They're, they're, not, they're not really happy with me right now. And so then God revealed to Moses that one of the things that would happen is that they would receive manna. If you research and understand the meaning of the word manna, it translates to mean enough. 
And one of the points of that, in that, was, you know, God's like, don't store it up. Like, don't get your little Rubbermaid containers and don't go buy a storage unit on 150 so that you need to put all your extra stuff in this storage unit. I'm a stuff girl, all right? So, like, when I met Tom, we joke, um, I'm a maximalist, and he is a minimalist. And so, one of the interesting things and one of the big lessons that he taught me is that I don't need to, like, try to hoard things. Like, I'm going to always have enough. If he gets a new shirt or a new pair of pants or a pair of shoes, he always gives one away. I don't. I try. But I'm not quite there yet because, like, I, ha I like to have a lot. I like to have different choices. I mean, these are my winter Birkenstocks. They have little fleece. You know, these were totally unnecessary, but I thought they were cute and they're warm. You know, like, and I didn't go give away two more pair of Birks. And Birks, you know, they're not $5. We get scared we're not going to have enough. And so we start clinging to those things. And, and that means that's where we're putting our hope. And the message that Moses told the people, he's like, look, you know, we got to have some faith and we've got to have trust. One of our West members had a very, very successful career at a company and had been there for years. And all of a sudden, he was let go. No explanation, no forewarning. They just let him go. And he was afraid. He was afraid that he was not going to be able to provide for his family in the same ways that he had been able to in the past. He shared, you know, his concern about finding a job at, at his station in life. But the interesting thing that I noticed, and this was like months and months ago, probably early, early spring, like over the summer when we would put out calls for the back-to-school bash that we help lead with the uh, nonprofit Inspire Our Children, which the bash, if you're newer to West, it we have it every year. We've had it 13 years. We upfit local students in a festival-like atmosphere so they don't have to feel lesser than to come to this event. But we served 1,200 kids this past year uh, with new tennis shoes, new backpacks, new school supplies, and uh, uh, gently used clothes, and, and all of it was fun. And so anyway, this gentleman that lost his job, he kept volunteering. Every time we'd send out a need, he would be there. And Elaine, who is on our staff, she was his liaison, and she's like, I just want you to know that we're so grateful for what you keep doing and what you keep giving. And he said... It's all I can do right now. I want to share and give of my time during the day while I can. And I know that God is going to provide. That was a powerful lesson just to watch his faith. You know, he wasn't hoarding his, his time. Because, you know, it's more than just about money, right? It's about like our time and, and what we do and give to other people. And again, you already do it. So, like, if you're sitting here or worshiping online, like, you're already there. And I hope that you feel that your life is rich because you have that connection. I, I do. I want you to see this verse. It's taken from 1 Timothy. It's in the words of Paul. And he said, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. 
You know, we, we talk about laying up treasures in heaven. You know, I think that's where we take, get that idea from that verse. That's not what that means. When it starts talking about building up treasures for yourselves so that you can have the life that is truly lifelike, that means right here, right now. And it means like when we start thinking about other people before ourselves or when we are willing it or we want something. I mean, it says enjoy it, right? Like we're not supposed to walk around in sackcloths. We're supposed to enjoy the resources that we have. And, and if we have those, let's enjoy them. But part of that, and this is another thing that religion really gets wrong, is, you know, we talk about being good. He does not say, now go be good. Paul says, do good. And in doing good, doing good, packing kindness closet boxes, showing up for the events that we have through this series, like doing for others, that is creating just this amazing foundation for a happy life. Some of the happiest people you will ever meet are the people that give themselves away. Remember that I shared just a few minutes ago that like the more money you have, they say that the less generous you are. It's because it should be about like a percentage. And, you know, in church world and for so many years they taught 10% and you should give 10% of your, of your income before it, you know, even goes to Uncle Sam. And that's certainly not what we're saying or what we're teaching. But what we are saying is like, if you give enough of yourself that you know you're giving, that's enough. And what does that mean? It means just taking that extra step, even if it's just a small step. To do something for someone else that maybe makes your day a little more uncomfortable. Like you could have used your time differently for something for yourself, but you took that extra step to do something for someone else. Uh, Tom, I don't think he's thrilled when I talk about him in person. Um, normally I ask ahead of time, but I didn't ask him for this privilege because he would have said no. But like the last three, <laughs> so I'm going to do it anyway, which is what he would say about me actually. But um, for the last three weeks, I shared with you in a devotion a few weeks ago, man, life's been insane. Like that one week, it started with Halloween, and then we had a sip and shop for Soul Creations, the candle and jewelry line that we've started to help support our Uganda campus and our Amped Ministries, and, and Dawn and Lane led that down at the point, and then um, I had to fly to D.C. to be in a, a documentary about the experience I had with Johns Hopkins, and then fly back, we had the golf tournament, and then we had the chili cook-off last Sunday, which was amazing. And having those nonprofits here, and thank you for cooking chili and making that possible. And then there was my last child and my daughter, my only daughter. It was her wedding. And so I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I'm not proud of my lack of boundaries, okay? So, And I'm also not telling you this to make you feel sorry for me because it's my lack of planning and my, like I told you, procrastination. When I'm overwhelmed with something, I just keep putting it off thinking it will go away or magically get fixed, and that does not happen. But um, I was getting up at 4 a.m. and going to the office in my pajamas because, like, it was too cold to change clothes, so I just went all bundled up, and I would work until 5 or 6 and then I'd go home and I'd be like, okay, I can, I can help here. I can walk the dogs or cook dinner. You can choose. And every single time, he's like, I've got it. I've got it. He didn't say he had it and then, like, go pout for the next three hours either. And then he'd be like, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? I mean, that's our relationship, and that's what an amazing human he is for me in our relationship. But that's the relationship we're called to be in with, like, God. Is how can I help? And that's one reason we're doing this series, is to show you, like, that there are agencies in our local midst, like the Humane Society. On Tuesday night, we're going to build at the West Office. So if you haven't signed up for a project, that would be a great one to sign up for. You can come to the West Office and help build planter boxes. And then on a different mission project, I think a next Saturday or something, they're going to go put the planter boxes, or we are, at the Humane Society because they're going to grow 
uh, different herbs and things to feed the exotic pets that are abandoned. What a cool mission, like, and given of your time to do that, like, it makes such a difference. And when we do those things, when we take those small steps, our lives, we're building up amazing lives for ourselves. And, and we have this peace and joy that we're not going to be able to find if we're chasing money or status or trying to hoard up what we have because we're afraid someday we won't have enough. Dawn came in the office on Tuesday morning, and and I think we uh, we try to be really energy conscious. So like I had my door shut, and and she said good morning. And I'm like hey, so I'm just trying to keep the heat in. And she's like I've had the best morning. I'm like oh cool, maybe something with her kids or with Jay. And she's like Jay and I went to the path house, and it was just us, but it was the best morning. Mike, remind me one more time what the Path House is. And, and it's an agency, a part of Fifth Street Ministries in Statesville. And they provide a, a warm shelter for the homeless in the community there that are not, you know, perhaps finding shelter in a homeless place uh, or transitional housing. And so the Path House is a place where they can come and individuals can do their laundry they can have a warm meal. They can sit down and watch TV. They can use the internet and have those resources there. And then the staff of the Path House, their goal is to build relationships with these individuals so that they can help them perhaps break that cycle of poverty and get out of homelessness and get on a better pathway for sustainability and they do it by creating the space and it's run largely by volunteers and people bringing them food and stuff that's why it's one of our missions and Don said my day could not have started better because I went and served I think that's just an example of how all of our lives could be rich so 13 years ago, right as West was getting ready to start, uh, we were still a part of Williamson's Chapel. We were going to be a campus of Williamson's Chapel. And we were supposed to go to India because it was a, I was the missions pastor there. And it was supposed to be this partnership that we were doing with Compassion International. And it, it just was not working out the way Compassion wanted it to. And we are not into voyeuristic mission trips. Like you go and uh, the rich white people go look at the poor people and go, oh, way, oh wow, you know, they're, they're so poor and throw some money at them. It's about building relationships. And so we were really wrestling with whether we were going to go to India or not anyway because, like, the first trip was just to, like, go and look and see. And so we made the call to, to cut it. And that very same day, I got a phone call from a gentleman that I'd been working with with a, a, an agency in Charlotte that gives away free tennis shoes. And he called and he said, hey, we're going to do an exploratory trip to Uganda and I know you guys have a heart for other people. Do you have any people that would want to go with you to Uganda with us to see what relationships we can build there? I'm like, well, actually, I have about 17 people that would be willing to go. And so two weeks later, we left for Uganda. And we met this man named Pastor Jeffrey. And Jeffrey had grown up an orphan. He was shot at one point in his journey when the LRA were doing their resistance and, and their, their fighting. And he vowed if he was able to grow up and become independent that he was going to use everything that he had to make sure that orphans in Uganda would be cared for. I want to show you a picture of what that looked like that first trip.
What you see behind is the land that was owned by Jeffrey. Not an organization, not any kind of entity. It was Jeffrey bought the land. He used all that he had and he bought the land. And then here are the blueprints that he had drawn up for what is called a pod house. It would be what we would reference as a group home. And eight to ten children were to stay in this pod house. And, and he had bought this land for these pod houses to be built on. Tomorrow in the devotion, I'll send you a lot of pictures of, of Acres of Hope, which is what this is now, over the years and, and that kind of stuff. But standing on that ground that day, Jeffrey's like, Pastor Andrea, would you pray that God will bless this land? Will you consecrate this land? I'd never done that before. I didn't know what to do. And so in those moments when I don't know what to do, I just hope God takes over. And so I heard words coming out of my mouth, which said, and and gracious God, please lead the right people into Jeffrey's midst so that his dreams to make the world a better place can come true. Now, a month later, it was Easter Sunday. It was our very first Easter preview service here, so A lot of us were here, and then back at the Mama Church, Rob Fuquay, our senior pastor, his daughter is one of the individuals, she's in the back in the middle, who went with us to Uganda, and she came home changed. It's why I know, like, traveling to Africa can seem intimidating, but it's worth it, it's worth every dime and this year you can go with Lance and Joycelyn and go to Acres of Hope or, or we need a few people to go with us to Kagumba. But Acres of Hope, you can never go wrong if you go there. It changes your life. Julie came back and she was such a changed person. And she's like, Dad, like you've got to get behind this. And on the Saturday night before Easter at 11 p.m., I was getting texts from Rob, and, and he's like, can you send me pictures? I want to talk about this tomorrow. I just, it's heavy on my heart. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I'll give you whatever you want. Please do. And then Rob had this, he calls it a moment of insanity or boldness. He could not decide which one. But at the benediction, and I want you to picture, if you've never been to Williamson's Chapel, it is a beautiful, beautiful space. And we built a a $4.5 million sanctuary while I was there. And I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. And it was packed. It was Easter Sunday, so all three services were just packed. It seats like 1,200 people. And at the biggest service at the time, it was the 930 service, Rob said something just came over him during the benediction. And standing there and looking out in the crowd, he said, all right, I know you. And I know that after this service, many of you are going to go to your second homes or on a cruise or maybe go buy a new boat this week. Or go look for a second home. You've got a lot of resources. We have a lot of resources. But $15,000 will give 8 to 10 young Ugandan children with no homes. $15,000 will give them a home. And so for those of you who can... Like, look, I don't have $15,000. I mean, you know, that would have been like falling on deaf ears. And, and I know that many of us here today, we don't have those resources. But like some folks there th- did. He said, instead of going and buying a new boat or upgrading your car or doing some home renovations that maybe don't really need to happen right now. What if you gave that $15,000 to Acres of Hope? What a difference it would make. He called me immediately after church. He's like, I've either made the biggest mistake of my career or it's going to be one of the best things ever. By Friday of that week, four people had called and said, I want to give fifteen dollars to $20,000.
So all of a sudden, while we were launching a church, we also were learning how to build pod, cal- pod houses in Nebi, Uganda. And now, I want to show you what some of the things look like there. I mean, that is just one of their structures now that started from nothing. And in the pictures that I send you tomorrow, you're going to see huge school buildings. Because over the last 13 years, people have given of themselves their time to build a life for others. And in doing so, have built lives for themselves. As our closing today, I want to show you a video of things that you have made possible just over the past several months by your presence, by being here, by your prayers, by your financial gifts that you give to West. We try to be really good stewards of your money. And also, like, so importantly, how you give your time. Money's important and vital and all that kind of stuff, but the way you give your time, it changes people's lives. Take a look. so much that we need to share so send a smile and show you care I'll give a little bit
Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for enabling us to have the things that we have in our lives. Help us to not take them for granted. Help us to not look at what we don't have or what we may have missed. Help us see all the riches that are around us. And then let us use ourselves and our resources to make this world a better place so that we can show other people you. For that is why we do what we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here today. In just a second, the lights are going to come on, and I invite you to join me out in the commons area. Uh, that's where I'll greet today so we can pack kindness closet boxes. Thanks for being here.